Hey, what's up everybody, Adels and Ness here from The Mimic Method, where we usually put out content for how you can learn four languages better. But today we're gonna try something a bit different. We're gonna broaden the subject matter a little bit. And I'm gonna discuss with you a specific way that I use artificial intelligence, namely ChatGPT, to enhance my own intelligence, enhance my own critical thinking, how I formulate and communicate ideas. It's a use case that I, th I think is pretty unique. Probably few people use it this way or are aware that you could use it this way. So for those of you watching, you might find this useful. And let's just kind of dump in, jump into it. This is a, a very meta video because the use case that I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna demonstrate that use case right now in creating this video. So we'll just jump into it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do dictation. Usually I'm using it on my phone where it's much easier, but dictate it here. Oops. I want to create a video for YouTube explaining how I use ChatGPT in a unique way. And what that way is, is whenever I have an idea that I'm trying to think through or communicate, because I'm a very divergent thinker and my intuitions are kind of probing around and connecting a bunch of different dots, uh, I'll get lost in that sauce and I want to converge it on a clear idea, a clear principle. So I've been using ChatGPT to help me with that. And basically what I do is I just open up the dictation on my phone or laptop and I start rambling out loud the way I am right now. Now, usually, when I'm talking to a human being, because I care about their time and attention, I will be putting a lot of effort into trying to get my point out as succinctly and clearly as possible and kind of land the plane before it's too late. But because you're a robot and I don't really care about your feelings, I can just kind of ramble and be redundant and make sure I can cover every single aspect of what I'm trying to say without worrying about you being bored or judging me or all that kind of stuff. So anyways, back to my original point, I want to make a video about how I'm using it this way and what my process is, which is basically just me rambling to get the idea out and then asking you afterward, what is the most succinct way in saying this? So that's basically what it is. If you were to make a video about this subject, how would you title this and then how would you explain this use case or explain this process as succinctly as possible. All right, and there you go. So let's just see what it does. How I use ChatGPT to clarify my thoughts, a divergent thinker's guide. Uh, mention that you will be explaining a unique way to use. Okay, yeah, got that. Explain the challenge of being a diverse thinker where your mind constantly connects different ideas, making it difficult to focus on a single clear principle. Describe how as a divergent thinker, your intuition leads to explore various ideas simultaneously. This often results in feeling lost or overwhelmed by the multitude of connection ideas. It's your tool to help converge this process. Open the dictation feature. Start talking about your ideas, allowing yourself to ramble and explore every aspect without self-censorship. That's a good word. So as I do this, you know, I start discovering new vocabulary I would use, like, yeah, self censorship that's what I'm doing. I'm kind of, when I'm talking to someone, I'm censoring myself all the time in order to be mindful of their time. Once you finish, at GPT to summarize your thoughts and provide the most succinct way of expressing them. Um, free yourself from being concise in the moment, capturing the full scope of your ideas. It's a huge part there. So a big thing for me is I want to capture everything. I'm like squeezing all the, the toothpaste out of the tube. And again, in conversation, I have to, you know, be judicious with that. But when talking to GPT, I don't have to. I can just go through over and over again and be redundant and get the full scope. Great. Uh, hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to share with you a unique way I use ChatGPT to help organize and clarify my thoughts. As a divergent thinker, I often find myself connecting various ideas and getting lost in the process. It can be challenging to narrow down to a clear, concise idea or principle. So here's what I do. I open the dictation feature on my phone or laptop and start talking about my ideas out loud. I let myself ramble and explore every aspect of what I'm trying to say without worrying about boring someone or being judged. This is where ChatGPT comes in. After I finish, I ask ChatGPT to summarize my thoughts and give me the most succinct way to express them. 
This approach has been incredibly helpful for me because it allows me to fully capture my thoughts without the pressure of being concise in the moment. Then ChatGPT helps me condense everything into a clear and concise summary. If you're also a divergent thinker or just struggle with organizing your thoughts, I encourage you to give this method a try. Let me know in the comments if you do and what works for you. So one thing I wanna emphasize here, this is obviously very useful in me creating content, but more fundamentally, it's useful in me organizing my own mind because the real purpose of writing, I find, is to clarify your own thinking. Because when you, you, in order to write and put onto a page, you have to clarify your thoughts. It's a forcing function for clarity. Um, so even if you don't publish things, or you don't publish a video, or you don't publish writing, the act of doing so is an enhancing effect on your thinking ability, which will apply to every other aspect of your life. So your life is better because you're thinking more clearly. And so that's a super important thing I want to communicate because I know a lot of you guys aren't necessarily content producers and that's fine. This is still a function to help you think through things. People are not aware that you can use AI to clarify your own thinking, not just you know cheat on your college essays. Um, so I'm gonna do another use case here because this is kind of uh, the first layer of the idea I wanted to share with you, but there is a deeper layer that is more key to me and that's based on the idea that um, that Thinking is based off of analogy. So if you want to be a good teacher, you have to figure out how to use an analogy to communicate the ideas that you're wanting to communicate. So what I'm often finding myself in is I'm intuiting some sort of principle somewhere, and then I am trying to figure out first, how do I articulate that principle in a concise way, but also beyond that, what are, what are some good analogies that embody this principle or allegories that I can use to illustrate this principle and um, and then that will help me again organize my own thoughts but also communicate it more effectively to people so I'll give an example of something that's been in my mind recently um, so let's do another thing here uh, I want you to help me come up with a, an allegory or in a metaphor that is appropriate for this phenomenon that I encounter and struggle to communicate to people. And it has to do with the process of healing or restoring something back to normal function. And what I find is that people will have, say, like a injury, say like a knee injury, and the initial trauma of that injury is very acute at the moment. And then of course afterwards, the, the pain and the trauma subsides. So you have a secondary phase post-trauma where people assume they are now in the healing phase already. But in reality, you've altered things or altered the structure in such a way that there is still an injurious stimulus that's there chronically inflaming the tissue or chronically causing a problem. But people don't realize that it's still there. So they think that they're healing when in reality, their body is just adapting to the presence of this chronic problem. And therefore they formulate a sense of how long the recovery process will take. They might think it'll take several months for the recovery, but that time frame is based off of the continued presence of that injurious stimulus that it once again is still there without them realizing it's still there. And if they removed that injurious object or that deformity in their, their knee or whatever the issue might be, that they would recover massively faster than they initially anticipated. So you might think it's six months of recovery, but actually it's only six days, which seems miraculous and unbelievable to people. But again, that's only because they're not aware of the idea of there still being a persistent chronic problem in their system. So when you have a chronic problem in the system, it both slows down the process of recovery and puts a cap on how much you can recover. And in fact, I would even use the word recover in this case. It's more like an adaptation to the problem. So you adapt to a higher function after the end of the initial trauma, but you're still under functioning. So that's the general principle I'm trying to communicate here. 
and I'm looking for an apt metaphor for it. I've come up with things before that I don't like, one being like having a foot on your throat. So the initial like stomping of the foot is traumatic and you can't breathe at all. And then the pressure's lifted a little bit. So now you start to like slowly breathe more. And if you, you can continually increase your breathing function and get more oxygen, but you still have the boot on your neck and you didn't realize the boot is still on your neck. So you've come to associate life to having a boot on your neck as normal. And the recovery process is very long. When if you just remove the boot off your neck, you will like instantly return back to breathing normal. So that's one example metaphor I've come up with, but I don't really like that metaphor. So see if you can summarize this principle in more concise terms and then give me a better metaphor and give me like a nice allegory that describes this concept, really emphasizing the, the aspects of the person not being aware of the problem and therefore formulating a belief system that is erroneous around their lack of awareness about the continual injurious stimulus. All right, work with that. There you go. So again, you see how rambly I was with it. I wouldn't talk to people this way normally because I respect people's times, but the robot does what I want. So let's see what it gives me. Summary of the principle. When someone experiences an injury, the initial trauma is acute and noticeable. Over time, as the acute pain subsides, people often assume they are in the healing phase. However, the injury may have altered structures in a, such a way that a chronic injurious stimulus remains, causing ongoing inflammation or problems. This chronic issue can make the recovery process seem longer than it truly is because the body is adapting to the presence of this chronic problem rather than healing fully. If the chronic problem were removed, recovery would be significantly faster. Boom. So that's what I said, but way more succinctly. And again, just me reading this, now when I, I'm like, you know, at a dinner party later and I want to talk about this issue, I'm going to say it way better with way less rambling as a result of just doing this process. Um, cool, here's my metaphor. Imagine your body is like a garden. An injury is like a storm that severely damages a tree. Initially, the damage is obvious with broken branches and uprooted soil. As time passes, the garden starts to adapt. New shoots might grow around the damaged tree and it might get, seem like the garden is recovering. However, beneath the surface, the roots of the tree are still entangled with debris from the storm, preventing true healing. The garden continues to struggle and adapt to this hidden problem. All right, the tale of the enchanted forest. Uh, now I got enchanted. In a distant land, there was an enchanted forest known for its vibrant and lush trees. One day, a fierce storm ravaged the forest, breaking branches and upbringing some of the oldest tree. The forest creatures worked tirelessly to clear the visible damage, and over time, the forest seemed to be healing. New plants grew and life slowly returned to normal. However, unbeknownst to the creatures, the storm had left behind enchanted stones buried deep in the soil. These stones emitted a subtle but harmful energy that prevented the trees from fully recovering. As months turned in years, the creatures know that despite their best efforts, the forest never regained its former glory. They believe that the recovery was a slow process, unaware of the true cause of their struggle. One day, a wise old owl discovered the enchanted stones and realized their harmful effects. The creatures swiftly removed the stones, and to their amazement, the forest began to thrive almost overnight. The tree grew taller and stronger than ever before, and the forest flourished in many ways they had never imagined before. It's moral. Sometimes the hidden remnants of past traumas can hinder true recovery. It is only by identifying and removing these hidden obstacles that genuine healing and growth can occur. All right, it's a bit more whimsical than I was going for, but interesting. Actually, I actually already asked this question before, so I'll just show you what the... Um, thing was so this is my original thing even me saying it now i was actually kind of faking it uh i have a but i was already way more clear in my explanation this is how i originally rambled it out so you see how long my rambling is here and i'm super redundant super rambly but understanding that with the robot the more redundant i am the better my results will be and i asked just for a metaphor this time i asked for an allegory just to try it out allegory i guess indicates that it needs to be like whimsical, which is not what I'm going for. So I'm just gonna stick with metaphor for now on. So I like this metaphor. Imagine a river flowing smoothly, providing water and sustenance to the land around it. One day a large boulder falls into the river, significantly blocking the flow. The initial impact causes the water to rise and flood the surrounding area, creating immediate and obvious damage. 
Over time, the water finds ways to trickle around the border, creating new smaller streams and adapting to the blockage. The flood subsides and while the river continues to flow, it is now restricted and much less effective at providing water to the ecosystem. People observe the diminished flow and believe that the river has somewhat recovered from the initial flooding, thinking the situation is stable. However, the presence of the boulder is still a significant obstruction, constantly disrupting the river's natural state. The land remains less fertile and struggles to thrive because the river is unable to flow freely. If someone comes along and removes the boulder, the river can immediately return its full natural flow. The land quickly becomes more fertile and productive again. The recovery is swift and more complete because the root cause of the problem, the boulder blocking the river, has been addressed. This metaphor highlights two key components, persistent obstruction. The boulder represents the chronic injurious stimulus that continues to hinder proper functioning, even after the initial trauma has passed. Rapid recovery. Once the obstruction is removed, the river and the ecosystem can quickly return to optimal functioning, illustrating how addressing the root cause can dramatically enhance the recovery process. And this metaphor conveys the absurdity of expecting full recovery without removing the injurious stimulus and emphasizes the importance of identifying and addressing the underlying cause to achieve true and rapid healing. So I was quite pleased to see once again the flow metaphor come here. I got can't believe I didn't think about that before because the flow is obviously what I concern myself with. I believe it is one of the fundamental metaphors for understanding the world. So um, as I read this, my, my, my ears and eyes kind of perk up on certain expressions that I'm definitely going to use moving forward, you know, um, such as uh, trickle. You know, it's a very visual thing like trickling. I'm going to use that like, oh, when you're blocked, things trickle around the blockage. Um, and ecosystem, I love how it connects the river to an ecosystem's flourishing, diminished flow, stable, situation is stable. So as my mind reads this, I'm like picking up on key words here and I'm allowing them to kind of seed my intuitions because now when I describe this specific subject to people, I'm gonna be that much more articulate with it because I've grabbed these words from the AI. And not just when I'm describing this subject, but when I'm describing all other subjects. This process is enhancing my capacity to think and to articulate ideas to people. And this is a, one of the foundational skills of life to live a successful life. So that's why I wanted to share this with you guys. A lot of people are not using AI at all, or they have a kind of um, stereotypical understanding of it. They're just like, oh, college kids writing essays. And as a general principle, I approach technology with a mental model of most people are looking at what the technology can do for them, like external things they can accomplish with the technology, which is good. I'm also using it. But what I'm most preoccupied with in my own journey is what what is this technology doing to me, right? So this smartphone, what's it doing to me? It's making me more distracted. It's making me more of this, right? But um, this bicycle, what's it doing to me? It's making me go outside more. It's making me more active, my metabolism flow, right? But also might be messing up my posture if I spend too much time on it. So I'm always asking these questions like, I'm primarily concerned with my body, my mind, my relationships with other people. And when I look at a technology, the question I'm asking is, how is the usage of this technology going to affect these core issues that are important, these fundamental things? And um, most digital technology is probably net negative on the way we feel and think and act and move and relate to people. Uh, but if you're smart with it, you can find ways to remove the bad and, and enhance the good. But you need to know what that is. So for me, there's lots of probably net negative uh, bad in the long term probably associated to our integration more with AI. But here is an example of, a I believe, a strong positive, which is... Um, using it as a way to enhance your thinking and your communication skills. So again, we've diverged a bit from our natural or our normal discussion about foreign languages and just talking more broadly about language and communication and thinking in general. If you find this useful and interesting, you want to make more videos like this, then please comment, like, and subscribe. Tell your friends about it. And then maybe I'll make another one. I have lots of different use cases for AI. Um, so if you find that interesting, let me know and I'll do more. All right. Thanks for watching. Keep flowing.